Welcome to the Gold Exchange Podcast, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. Now, on to today's episode. Welcome back to the Gold Exchange Podcast. My name is Benjamin Adelstein. We are here in the New Orleans Conference with founder and CEO of Monetary Metals, Keith Weiner, and our special guest, Dominic Frisbee, author, commentator, and one of the funniest guys we know. Dominic, pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for having me, folks. Uh, pleasure to be here. Dominic, uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, I just found out British Finance Minister Kwasi Kwarteng out six weeks after the job, fired. What do you have to yeah, say? Yeah, well, he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and uh, I've got to say, I really liked his budget. Uh, the, the budget, we got a new Prime Minister and a new Chancellor, as you probably know, about a month ago, six weeks ago. And they surprised everyone with their first budget because they did that heinous thing of slashing income tax and they uh, slashed corporation tax and they, they tidied up a load of other things as well. And I'm a low tax guy. I believe um, economies are more productive the lower tax there is and uh, lower taxes and populations are more inventive and innovative and so on in low tax jurisdictions. And I think there's a correlation between tax and freedom and the lower tax, the more free people are and all that. And um, so I quite liked his budget, but it totally took the markets by surprise and the gilt market in particular was hit. But what goes unreported in this whole story, and it really makes me cross, is that in the UK, Kwarteng's budget got the blame for the collapse in the gilt markets. But if you actually look at a chart of the gilt markets, you'll see that the collapse in the gilt markets began the day before Kwarteng's budget. And what had happened is on the previous Tuesday, so the the Kwarteng's budget was on the Friday, the collapse began on the Thursday, but on the Tuesday, the Bank of England published their gilt sales and they announced quantitative tightening. So whereas for the last, since 2008, the Bank of England has been printing money and buying bonds, or gilts as we call them, they suddenly turned around and said, no, 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 we're selling this many gilts gilts and this is the amount we're going to sell and we're going to sell them over this time frame. Now you may remember they did exactly the same thing with gold in 1999 and they published all their gold sales to the market We've written a few and they, things about they that. tanked the gold market and it's because they've obviously got some protocol or whatever they have to announce their sales but that's not what you do if you're trying to get the best price for your product. You don't broadcast your sales or your purchases in advance and that is what began the, the, the um, tanking in gilt markets. But then, because this trust Kwarteng um, budget was essentially a low tax, kind of, I suppose you'd call it a neo-Thatcherite thing, neo-Reaganite thing, all their ideological enemies, their political opponents, which dominate in the media, just swarmed all over it. Nobody was expecting it, which made them even more angry because they didn't get all the leaks beforehand. And so he was blamed and all the panic that ensued in the financial markets and the Bank of England got off scot-free. And then at the first sign of panic, the Bank of England started printing again. The very first sign of panic. So that just shows you the default thing is print. When in doubt, print. Printer is coming. So I'm sorry to see Kwarteng go. Um, I'm a pro-low tax guy. And now the problem is, what has happened is that slashing corporation tax and slashing income tax has now become toxic, politically toxic, and no government minister with any kind of ambition whatsoever is going to attempt to do that for probably another 20 or 30 years. So our little moment, like one of the reasons I voted for Brexit was because I thought we could turn ourselves into Singapore on Thames, into a low tax um, you know, free entrepreneurial, blah, 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 on the edge of Europe, between Europe and America, between Asia and America, all this stuff. And, you know, basically enjoy a similar boom to the one we had in the 80s and put the UK back on the map. But I'm afraid now we've just turned ourselves into a large government. And, you you know, what we're learning at the moment is if you can print money in America, if you are energy independent, which America for the most part is, but you cannot print money and be energy dependent, which is what Europe is, which is what Japan is. And that's why there's this huge gulf in the dollar 
and the European currencies and the, Jap and, and, um, the Japanese currency. You, you, you can't. And we, we, we could be energy independent, but we're not because of short-sighted policy and too much um, power and influence exerted by anti-fossil fuel bodies. And so, you know, the UK now has really serious problems. And I thought that budget was a potential root, root out of them. You know, she's gambling on growth to solve our stuff, but we're not going to get the growth now and UK anemia continues. We've got big problems. We've got big problems is maybe an understatement, which is kind of scary. Let, let's talk about energy policy for a second. Keith, I know you wrote a lot about these kind of two different policies that were undertaken and that really undermined uh, energy stability and energy independence. Why don't we walk through that for a second? Yeah, in, the, in the UK, so I think it was around 2017 or 2018, they passed two stupid laws. One, forcing all, uh, or maybe not all, but most of the heavy energy users to switch from oil and coal to natural gas and the other one prohibiting domestic production of natural gas via fracking, which is basically that's how you produce natural gas. So you can't produce it anymore domestically, and everybody who's not using it has to switch to it. Then you get the perfect storm of the logistics and shipping snafus of lockdown and whiplash due to COVID, and suddenly you can't import the natural gas anymore. Um, and at the same time, obviously, woes with Russia, and you know, the price of natural gas skyrockets 10x or something like that, shutting down fertilizer production domestically in the UK, which is gonna cause a horrible food skyrocketing. Um, and um, you know, the point I usually make is that people call this inflation, but it isn't monetary. But I think in this context of it's energy It's inflation and stupidity. <laughs> right, and, but in this context, it's just contributing to the general political woes of the UK and um, we have enough natural gas in, in, under Lancashire and Yorkshire, which is in the north of Britain, north of England, to not only be energy independent, we could be a net exporter. We've got the natural gas there, but instead we've chosen to import it. Now this is how stupid it is, because part, you know, you, you look at all the forecasts and even with all the net zero and trying to go green and, 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 and renewables and all the rest of it, f demand for fossil fuels is only going to stop increasing by after 2030. So demand is going to carry on growing until 2030. And yet nothing has been spent on production. So that means the price can only go one way. But the idea that it is somehow greener not to produce... So in this world in which we need fossil fuels, the idea that it's somehow less green not to produce it at home where we can oversee it and do it responsibly, but instead to import it from wherever, Russia or wherever it is, and the idea that they're going to do it in a more green way than we are, uh, we're just... They're not. So what, what they're doing is they're going... We don't want the pollution, we don't want the environmental fallout, but because it's out of sight okay. and out of mind, therefore it doesn't exist. I'm sorry, it still goes up into the atmosphere. You know, it doesn't matter whether it goes via Qatar or via Russia or wherever it goes up via, it still goes up there. So you may as well do it yourself and do it more cleanly and create a load of jobs and then not be dependent on, on questionable regimes for your energy policy. It's just dumb. It's done on a green level, it's done on, dumb on an economic level, it's done on a financial level, and it's done on a moral level. Couldn't say it better ourselves. To add, green is dumb on an economic and a moral level. Many, so. Often, <laughs> yeah, the intention I, is right, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions, as a famous economist once said. Well, let, let's go there on these kind of good intentions. So, obviously, inflation is high, but we just kind of went through some non-monetary factors that are contributing to these high prices and this inflation. Now we've got an even worse factor, which is rate hikes. This is going to, quote, destroy demand. That's what the Fed and these other banks are saying. We need to tamp down demand. But that's jobs, that's corporations, and let's talk about, you know, a power plant or a fracking plant. Those need to be made, and that doesn't happen in the snap of the fingers, especially with high rates. So what do you think with, with high rate hikes? I don't see how this energy crisis is going to be abated. If anything, it's probably going to get worse. Is that right, Keith? Yeah, well, my, my theory is that um, the interest rate is one of the most important costs in producing, especially putting something new into production. If you hike rates, 
you have to wait for prices to rise to get a bigger profit margin before a project is profitable. So if your only concern was rising prices uh, and you didn't care about any of the other economic damages caused by falling rates, you'd want falling rates. Because right. it's a rising subsidy for producers. Now we have rising rates, which means costs to produce go up, which means plants and mines and wells are delayed, which means you know, further uh, pressure on, you know, upward pressure on, on prices. Yeah, I mean, interest rates is basically the government setting the price of money or the central bank setting the price of money. And if they set the price of money high, the money's going to get more expensive, so people are going to borrow less, which means less investment. But let's face facts, they didn't invest money in fossil fuels and mining even when <laughs> money was cheap. So, you know, but what annoys me about inflation is, is it used to be the definition of inflation was you inflate, you blow up the money supply with the consequence of higher prices. Then inflation came to mean simply higher prices. Now inflation just means higher prices in a certain basket of goods and services, which for the most part are prone to the deflationary forces of increased productivity and China exporting its cheap labour and all the rest of it. Now, if you included, for example, house prices, like if you look at house prices in the UK, but in between 1997 and 2007, the housing stock grew by 10%, okay? And the population grew by 5%. So if house prices were purely a function of supply and demand and population, they should have fallen slightly over the period. They didn't. They went up by over 300%, okay? And then you look at money supply growth over the same period, and that increased by 300%. So house prices are a direct reflection, not in the, the dynamics of what's going on on the ground, but they're a reflection of money supply growth. But they don't include house prices in their measures of inflation. Now, if they'd, include, if they'd had 10 15% annual house price inflation in their measures of inflation, interest rates would have gone up a lot quicker a lot sooner. But they didn't include them because it meant they could print money. Similarly, you know, you look at the inflation in the stock market, financial assets and bond price and so on. If they were included in measures of inflation, then interest rates would be a lot higher. But they're not. So they, they print money and it's all, oh, look, everything's great. It was just, it's like 13% of money, of newly created money, goes into the sector in question, which apart from anything else is, is prone for, to the deflationary force of, of, of um, globalisation and chi cheap Chinese labour and all the rest of it. Well, now that's going because we're living in a deglobalized world and COVID and supply chains and all the rest of it, and suddenly nobody can understand why there's inflation. Well, I don't agree with your definition of inflation. I, 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 we, we, we talk a lot about you know, definitions. You want to add to uh, deglobalization, and, and, and the, uh, the other word for that would be rising nationalism, as mm. I think a very worrying trend. Um, so much of the quality of life we enjoy in uh, Western countries comes from the ability, you know, the New Zealanders kind of figured this out in the 1980s, that all this protectionism, because they didn't think New Zealand farms would be competitive against, I think, British farms. And somebody kind of read Adam Smith and said, law of comparative advantage, they simply have better pasture land, particularly for sheep and lambs. So isn't today most, most um, you know, lamb and, and wool imported from New Zealand, even in the UK, not to mention in the US, you know, it's New Zealand lamb. And one by one, as these exports or imports turn off, we're gonna see rising prices because things become genuinely scarcer. And, um, you know, in America in particular, there's this attitude of, we don't need imports. We're America, we can make everything, we're a big market. Well, when you have to produce things at the scale only for sale and purchase in America, there's going to be a lot less of a lot of things and what's left is going to be much more expensive, let alone in smaller countries like the UK, where yeah. things become scarce and, you know, impossible to obtain. And like, you know, most markets have a certain minimum scale. Like think semiconductors. The idea of semiconductors being, you know, designed and manufactured locally just for sale within your city is absurd. Those are global businesses. And if they're forced to shrink down and become only a national business, we're going to find that computer chips go back to, you know, what they used to cost in the 1980s, 
when, uh, and even then it was a global market. And they won't be very good. Much lower and, you know, right. One of, one of the, like, you know, we eat vast amounts of lamb in the UK and we eat vast amounts of New Zealand lamb. And I think New Zealand is literally on the other side of the world to where the UK is. The Antipodes, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's like, right. And, and you kind of think, surely it's cheaper to just import Welsh lamb. And, you know, or even English lamb, and we, it's not like there's a shortage of sheep in the UK, there are loads of them, but it obviously works. And, but the, the, the problem I have is that one of the reasons that we outsource so much production to places like China or wherever it is, is that the cost of government is much smaller there. And so, for example, you look at industry, the, 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 the cost, you know, we nationalised a lot of industry during the war and then after the war and then the, the unions were holding the government to account and meant wages went up too high and in the end they had to cl close down the coal mines and the steel making industry. We have a rich history of industry in the UK. If the cost of government was much smaller, then a lot of those industries could survive and compete with China and the rest of the world. But because our cost of government is so high, in the UK, they can't. And the way the consumer has benefited is he's, because of Chinese exports or wherever it is exports, you, you can avoid that cost of government. The cost gets driven down and the local business goes bust. But the local business, in a world of nationalisation, the, the, the local business can't start up again because that cost of government is still there. And you get a guy, we're back to where we were, you know, we've got Truss and Kuateng who would, you know, they're, they're small tax, low tax, small government guys. You know, they were trying to, you know, slashing corporation tax, slashing these taxes were a, a, an attempt to make Britain competitive by slashing the cost of government. And that's gone now. Well, I, I want to get to your book. So you wrote this book, Daylight Robbery, right? We're talking about taxes now. There was at one point, I remember, a discussion of having a kind of global tax rate. Hey, everyone, here's the issue. There's a race to the bottom. If the UK has lower tax rates than the US, well, you know, companies are going to flee to the UK. Now, that was described as a race to the bottom. Uh, I've got I, the direction wrong. Yeah, I think you've got the direction wrong, guys. So there, there was this discussion at some point to have a kind of global discussed tax rate. Eh, everyone will do 15%, so there's nowhere to hide. Let's talk about taxes. I mean, they're, they're daylight robbery is described. They're a huge burden. W w what can you tell us about taxes? Well, they try to impose international taxes. Uh, and agree on them, but because every you know every political part, every government in every country is at a different rate stage in their electoral cycle, and they're trying to make themselves popular or whatever, and they often have different ideologies. You might have a left-wing government in one place and a right-wing government somewhere else. It's very hard to get people to agree, and so you've got these kind of supra-national organisations, the IMF and various others, but they they struggle to get people to agree. So I think we're a way off that, but I do think it's sort of going to come by the back door a little bit as we go into international money, you know, IMF, SDRs and all that. Um, you know, inflation and printing money is a, it's a, just another tax, albeit by the back door. The Euro European Union is trying to centralise the collection of VAT, which would be your sales tax um, in Brussels, and it's trying to set it there so that each um, government body can't, each um, nation can't set its own tax policy. If it centralises it there, that will be a step in that direction. They also tried to impose, they didn't get it through, but they tried to impose their digital, what was it called, their digital Central tax? Central bank, yeah, digital currency. No, 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 not the CBDC, the, the, the digital tax on, on Google and all those oh, yes, international yes. things. Uh, I think it was 2%, whatever it was. And they tried, that would be a centralised tax in Brussels. So Brussels is very much a centralising force that's, that's, you know, I argue that tax is power, and it is, because if a ruler loses its tax revenue, it loses its power, whether that ruler is a king, an emperor, a government, whatever. Um, and, and so by centralising tax collection and, and, and tax policy in Brussels, they're trying to centralise power in Brussels. They haven't made that work yet, but you can bet your bottom dollar they're trying. And... Um, Fortunately, they haven't made it work internationally, but given how much, you know, power like the, 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 um, 
the WHO or a body like that has on international health policy, I guess it's not going to be that long before they have the sim similar amount of thing on international tax policy. But we're away off that at the moment. Do you think in the UK, given the sentiment for Brexit and then that Brexit happened, but perhaps not in the way that a lot of the Brexiteers expected, do you think that there's an increasing or decreasing support or sentiment for you know, having a supranational body that dictates you know, local uh, policy? Well, one of the reasons a lot of people voted for Brexit was the, f the number one given reason was sovereignty. And we wanted to make our own laws and set our own policy and all that kind of thing. And a big subset of sovereignty is immigration. We've seen incredible levels of immigration into the UK in the last 20 or 30 years. And people feel threatened by it, they feel scared by it, they feel their national um, identity is being eroded by it. What tends to happen is that, um, for example, in the media you'll see uh, loads of national people, indigenous people, overlooked in favour of the immigrant. Um, you just see different sets of rules for different sets of people and it's made a lot of people very angry and very concerned and very frightened. And what's happened since Brexit is that whereas the, the immigration previously was coming from Europe, now instead of going right we're going to lower levels of immigration, because one of the reasons there's so much anger is that the local worker was working at one rate, the immigrant labourer comes in and works at a cheaper rate, the local labourer gets put out of business, he either ends up unemployed or he has to work at the lower rate and so you get this increasing gap between rich and poor and that's what made a lot of people angry. Now I'm aware that there's lots of different dynamics going on and some you will agree with and some you won't but what's happened is instead of they're now relying on, on cheaper labour coming in from Europe, it's now coming in from the rest of the world. <laughs> so it's coming in from Africa and Asia and that's made everyone feel even more threatened and so on. Now, you may say this is a good thing, you may say it's a bad thing, whatever, but it, it's, a, a lot of people are going, no, you've, you've taken one thing and made it worse. So, you know, people do feel frightened and, and you look at areas of the UK, famous English cities, they're unrecognisable from what they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. Unrecognisable in terms of the demographics. But people don't like it. They feel their cultural identity is being destroyed. And so, I, think, I, I do think the polls now show that given the choice again and given how Brexit's been handled and given what's happened with immigration since, a lot of people will go, oh, actually, no, we shouldn't have voted for it. But I don't blame people for voting for Brexit for that. I blame the way Brexit's been handled and the way that those people just are not represented politically. I think appetite for sovereignty over policies and in particular tax and monetary policy do you think appetite for that sovereignty will increase or decrease as a result of this fallout? I think, I think the, the problem with British politics, you can't reform it because of the two-party system we have in the country. Uh, other parties have come along uh, and they've attempted and they've never been able to win any seats in a general election. Even Farage, you know, probably the most famous British politician of the last 30 years, he was never an elected MP, he never got into Parliament. He was just he, uh, able to, MEP, right? Member of MEP, European but whatever. It was nothing. <laughs> yeah, he was never an MP, never a member of Parliament, and he was able to exert incredible influence on the sidelines and influence Tory policy, and he kind of made Brexit happen. But he must be looking at what's how it's been managed and just in a fit of despair because what people wanted to happen has not been delivered, and there there is a huge gulf in what people want and what politicians are doing. And I would say over 50% of the British population feel unrepresented. So there is a gap for another party, but it cannot happen while we have the political system that we have. But the Tories now are so incredibly unpopular, they're like more unpopular than anyone ever. They're more unpopular than... More unpopular than, than taxes. Well, I was, was, I'm trying to think of a celeb... They're more unpopular than Bill Cosby or something. They're just like incredibly unpopular. Wow. Oh, I, you know, I, I, I see some similarities and some differences, you know, between the U.S. and the U.S. Can you have a third party in the U.S.? You can't. No, right? our system 
it's rigged. I, I wouldn't say rigged. I would say the, the U.S. system, the coalitions have to form up front by which groups, you know, ascribe to, subscribe to which party. Whereas in a parliamentary system, you know, you have these different parties and then the coalitions form, you know, the Greens and the Scottish Nationalists and whatever, um, you know, form later and sometimes you get a surprising coalition to form a government. You know, in the U.S., the strange bedfellows occur up front. Everyone knows with the Republicans, you know, what you get with the Democrats. But I was going to, my comment... Yeah, and I think probably the Conservative Party is not unlike the Republican Party in that yeah. it's, a, it's, it's basically a coalition. Except you know, for... You've got Social Democrats on the left of the Conservative yeah. Party and you've got hardcore Libertarians on the right of it. Except that, that your Libertarian right is pro-monarchy. Yeah. And the Americans totally don't get that. But I was just going to make a very simple well, uh, you, quip. You should have stuck with us, guys. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you can buy us back. Or maybe that, we'll that, buy you guys. That ship has sailed. But uh, I was just going to make a very simple quip late. that whichever party is the one that has most recently offended the majority of the electorate, which usually means the one that's in power, yeah. becomes the one that's most hated. Mm. And so the other party is not loved, but they're simply less hated than the incumbents. And so it's, you know, the 2010, well, 2008, you know, Bush, McCain, everything was just perceived to be so bad. Sweep the left in, sweep the Democrats in. 2010, Obamacare, highly unpopular, a bunch of other things, sweep the Republicans in. And the pendulum swings based on which party has offended you most recently. Um, that, that's, what, that's how ours works. Um, but unfortunately, whichever one you elect, politics seems to get steadily worse and government grows. grows. It just, just never stops growing. And w we seem to be living in now where the UK is governed by talking heads on Twitter and, and focus groups and polling and the media. And so the media will attack the government, whatever it does. And so we've had six, seven, whatever, how many, more than that, years of Tory. But it's basically been the Tories pandering to the centre. So I'm, I'm almost hoping that a far left government gets elected because that's the only way we can have like libertarian policies imposed because the media will just take the other side of the far left government and the far left government will do everything it can to pander to the media and you end up with a libertarian <laughs> outcome. That's, it, that's the guess, last uh, hope the, that the I'm clutching The one thing you have there is that the far left is more odious and more obviously bad because they're like anti you know, anti the country, anti the people, they're just really nasty. You know, if you get a, um, I don't know what Jeremy Corbyn is, or uh, what's his name, Galloway or Galloway? Galloway, Galloway's all right. Uh, you know, there's Good just guy. really libertarian odious. Libertarian left. All these odious fellows. Hey, Corbyn's um, not odious, he's all right. At least he's uh, honest about his politics. <laughs> he's right, he's more yeah, honest about it. Yeah, this is honest, right. Um, that, you know, that could cause people to um, say, wait a minute. There was something about the Tories Corbyn that was good. Corbyn can tell you what a woman is. Corbyn can tell you what a woman is. The, the current Labour administration can't agree on what a woman is. Well, actually, let's, let's talk about a definition real quick. Uh, it seems like in America, we can't agree on what a recession is. Uh, are we in one, or is there even such a thing as a recession anymore? Obviously, we've had two falling quarters of GDP. That, that's no longer a recession, apparently. Uh, you know, we've been joking that there was an old Fed chair and he was ordered by the president not to say the words recession. So instead he said, I'm not gonna say recession, but I will say banana every time I mean recession. So are we in a recession? Are we in a banana? Um, and yeah, this kind of playing with definitions, you, you would think that with your point about the media, the question is if, if we had two falling, uh, Two, two consecutive falling GDP, would that not be called a recession if another person was in power? I, I think the answer is pretty obvious there. Well, it's just so academic. And uh, it's a bit like inflation. It almost doesn't matter right. how you define it because it means different things to different people. And it's, it's an academic def definition that the media will jump onto. But, you know, I, I, we're certainly in a time of falling productivity whether it's recession or not and I mean it's it's we must have gone into recession in COVID but was it only one quarter maybe well I think there was a big hit and they they did their one policy move their one trick pony get that money in there yeah I mean I mean really uh, yes yeah, so I can't answer that question because it's just a it's a it's it's stupid definitions and and I don't care
Well, I think you're right. Listen, and I don't care either. All I know if, is that government's if, growing. If know. I lose my job, the government debt grows and, and everything is more expensive, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it banana, recession, inflation. I don't care. It's hurting the average citizen, right? And, and it's a real problem. So before we end, uh, I'll have one more question for sure. you. But where can we find all of your great work? Obviously, we want to hear more about what you're doing. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I write a newsletter uh, on Substack. And so the, it's called The Flying Frisbee. And the web address is frisbee.substack.com. My surname's Frisbee, F-R-I-S-B-Y. And 80% of the stuff, 90% of the stuff I put out is free. And then there's a paid option if you want to get like mining tips and see what I'm doing in my portfolio, which at the moment is I'm, I'm just like trying not to drown. But the uh, the... That's that's my newsletter, frisbee.substack.com. And so I want to end here. We're at the New Orleans Investment Conference. What is some of the best investing advice that you've either recei uh, received, you want to give us, or maybe you want to give the, the government here? What, what, what should we tell people? What's some advice that we can get? Well, the best piece of investment advice I was ever given was in 2011, and it was buy Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe we'll buy some Bitcoin as we end the uh, conference. Thank you, Dominic, so much. We've loved having you. Thank you. This episode was brought to you by Monetary Metals. Monetary Metals is a different kind of gold company. Others buy and sell gold. Monetary Metals operates the Gold Yield Marketplace, a platform of products that offer a yield on gold paid in gold to investors and institutions. And our gold financing simplified. Reliable financing denominated in gold with a built-in hedge for gold using and gold producing businesses. To learn more, visit www.monetary-metals.com. See you next time.